This is a short video showing the anatomy of the cranial nerve nuclei. Now, before we begin, we see this picture here with some of the nuclei labeled, and it's important to kind of orient you by telling you that this is the posterior view of the brain without the thalamus or the cerebellum. So the posterior view, so it's like looking at the back of someone's head, obviously without their skin, without any subcutaneous tissue. You're also removing the thalamus, which is in the diencephalon, and you're removing that little mini brain in the back, the cerebellum, and you're looking at their, it's kind of essentially their brain stem. Uh, because you're removing the thalamus and the cerebellum from the back of the head. So this is a different view uh, from the from from the view where you would see all the cranial nerves. This is the cranial nerve nuclei, and they're best visualized from this posterior view. Now this diagram has been divided into motor and sensory regions. Motor are in this light shade of red, and sensory is in this light shade of blue. Now you know that some of the cranial nerves have motor functions, some have sensory functions, and some have both. And that's kind of represented in this uh, in this diagram of cranial nerve nuclei. It's also important to kind of discuss what cranial nerve nuclei are. Uh, they, they're essentially places where the cranial nerves synapse before going out or coming into uh, deeper parts of the brain. So these are like, these are nuclei, these are collections of cell bodies uh, where these nuclei or where these cranial nerves synapse. So the very top here, the highest point, this is the most superior point, is the cranial nerve three nuclei. Um, there's uh, also another one up here. There, there are two in this in this section represented. Here, let me highlight it right here. There's there are two nuclei in this section right here. The highermost one is the Edinger Westfall nuclei, which sends parasympathetic innervation to the pupils. Now, both of these in the section are uh, are cranial or our nuclei for cranial nerve three, the Edinger Westfall is specifically parasympathetic nerves to the pupils for constriction of the pupils. The lower half of that red shaded region are the other functions of cranial nerve three, which as you know, is ocular motor functions. Right below that is the trochlear nerve nuclei. This is cranial nerve four. Cranial nerve five is one of the big ones. It has motor and sensory function, and those nuclei are kind of right below cranial nerve four. You can see they're represented there. Cranial nerve six is below that as well, and under cranial nerve six is cranial nerve seven. So, so far, these are pretty easy to remember. You're going from the top of the body to the bottom, from higher up in the brainstem to lower in the brainstem, and you have three, four, five, six, and seven. Uh, important to remember that uh, these are mostly motor nerves, but with the exception of cranial nerve five, which has a sensory component as well. Cranial nerve eight is a little lower down, uh, and this is a sensory nerve. Now it gets a little more complicated. Some of these cranial nerve nuclei aren't exclusive to one cranial nerve. Uh, first example of this is nucleus ambiguous, which uh, governs the functions of swallowing and phonation. Phonation is just speaking, which is pretty much governed by cranial nerve 10, which innervates many of the muscles in your larynx and pharynx, uh, which you use to make your voice, make your voice. Uh, not necessarily the fine motor movements of your tongue, but to produce noise, phonation, you need cranial nerve 10. Swallowing uses cranial nerves 9 and 10. And both of these functions have nerves that synapse in the nucleus ambiguous, shown in that strip on the motor side of the diagram. On the other side, you see the nuclei for the glossopharyngeal nerve, sensory function of the pharynx, and the vagus nerve, which is sensory function of quite a bit, including the abdominal viscera, the thoracic cavity, some of the thoracic cage, uh, a lot of the gut, the first two thirds of the gut, um, a lot of that goes up through this nuclei on its way into the deeper parts of the brain. Hypoglossal is a little more medial to nucleus ambiguous. Hypoglossal, of course, is innervation of the tongue. So neurons that fire out to the tongue would make a synapse in this shaded region. And lastly is another nucleus that's a little oddly named again. This is nucleus solitarius, which uh, governs taste and chemoreceptors and baroreceptors. Now these functions all use cranial nerves seven, 
9, and 10. Uh, you might remember that cranial nerve 9 specifically provides chemo and baroreceptors for the carotid body, while cranial nerve 10 provides chemo and baroreceptors for the aortic arch. The, as for taste, the anterior two-thirds of the tongue is innervated by cranial nerve 7. The posterior one-third of the tongue is innervated by cranial nerve 9, and the epiglottis for taste is innervated by cranial nerve 10. And uh, all of these functions synapse in the nucleus of solitary tract, or the nucleus solitarius. And lastly is another nuclei uh, specific for the vagus nerve. And this is for the motor innervation to the viscera. Uh, it's mostly parasympathetic process. You can think of it as that rest and digest. That's the vagus nerve innervating your, uh, your gut and some of your other internal organs um, in, in the body cavities. And those nerves would synapse here. That's it for the cranial nerve nuclei. I hope this was a helpful overview of their location in the brainstem.